Okay, so um, I'll be picking up from where uh, Jan uh, left off. Uh, there'll be a little bit of overlap between our talks, but what I'd like to do uh, actually as we get into this is let's start with a demo right off the bat. I think it's interesting to kind of see the state of the art for this kind of technology and see how it works. So I'm gonna jump right to uh, uh, a demo uh, then on this. Uh, let me pull this up. And you'll see on the screen, uh, there should be a, a four different languages showing up on the screen, uh, captions in the four different languages. So I'm speaking right now in English and you should see the captions in the upper left quad, uh, quadrant, um, the uh, English uh, transcript of what I'm saying. So this is useful in the context of let's say uh, accessibility. I can see the English of what's being said, but at the same time, I'm getting captions in other languages uh, in the other quadrants on the screen. So let's, uh, let's go a step further here. Uh, let's open the, this discussion up to, uh, to Jan, who uh, is a native uh, German speaker. And let's talk with Jan uh, in German and uh, see how it does there. Now, I do wanna point out that this isn't perfect. There will be mistakes. Uh, it will make mistakes and you will see those mistakes show up both in the transcription and the translation. And that's exactly to be expected. Uh, the technology is not error proof. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, talk with Jan then. Uh, so Jan, um, uh, what are your plans uh, this coming up weekend? It's Friday now, so you must have plans for the weekend. Eigentlich würde ich gerne meine Eltern besuchen. I didn't see the captions. <laughs> Eigentlich würde ich gerne meine Eltern besuchen, aber das ist zurzeit etwas schwieriger, da wir mit Covid äh, beschäftigt sind. Meine Eltern leben in Deutschland und deswegen muss ich gucken, wie die aktuellen Quarantäneregeln sind, ähm, um sie besuchen zu können. Oh, that sounds really complicated. That's unfortunate. Uh, uh, can you uh, go there quickly or do you have to quarantine for a while? Es hängt davon ab, wie lange man bleibt. Und es gibt einige Ausnahmen, aber ohne Ausnahmen muss man zurzeit zwei Wochen in Quarantäne gehen, um von den Niederlanden nach Deutschland zu gehen. That's, that's really difficult. Um, okay, well, thank you. That gives you a sense of, of, of this. We could have it with additional languages, like uh, I could go in the lower quadrant here, uh, quadrant and uh, uh, speak some Russian, let's say, and then it would uh, show the captions. But I think you have a good sense of uh, how the technology functions. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, let's continue this demo a little bit further. Uh, I'm going to open the door here for people in the audience to join. Uh, so I'm going to uh, do a couple things. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody so that you can't talk, but you can see the caption uh, stream as, uh, as it comes up, uh, just like you're seeing here. And I'll have a couple of slides on that. And I'm going to unlock the session so you can actually join this session. So let me start my slide deck again. Um, and I'm getting there. Okay, so we were in the demo. Uh, and uh, if we go to the next slides, uh, you can join this conversation. So the conversation that's currently active and I'll keep it open for the uh, entirety of my talk. So you can kind of see uh, you know, how it captions uh, when I'm talking, where it makes mistakes uh, and the kinds of things that Jan talked about in fact. Uh, you can join from, an, if you have the translator app on your phone, you can join uh, using the translator app. Uh, many of you, I realize, are probably operating from your computers. So if you're using the computer, uh, you can join from the computer. All you need is a browser. So go to your browser. Uh, this could be Chrome. It could be Safari, whatever the browser is that you're using. Uh, Edge, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you want to go to this URL that's listed here. Uh, and then put in this code. This is the session code for us right now. So this is basically uh, the, the transcription session that I have active that you just saw. Uh, it will continue uh, to transcribe and it can broadcast then to your local browser. So the code is right here, K-T-A-H-P. You wanna go to this site, translate.it or translate it uh, and specify that code. And that will allow you then to see the captions uh, in English or in your own language, or even in both languages, if you wanna do that. Uh, and uh, we built this as a service, uh, specifically, uh, this was built, as Jan said, this was built in 2016, uh, and we've made a number of improvements to it over time. 
Uh, this is uh, what we call a multi-device, multilingual communication system. Uh, you can join from the web, from apps, like on Windows or on mobile apps. Uh, and we're also building one for OneNote. This is interesting. Uh, OneNote is a note-taking uh, service that's oftentimes used in the classroom. And you can stream the captions straight into your notes, uh, which a lot of students are now starting to test, where they can actually you know, get the caption feed uh, in, let's say, whatever the language is spoken in the classroom or in their native language, and then make notes on top of it as the caption stream is coming into their notes. It's a very, very interesting uh, feature. Um, the, uh, there are a number of scenarios where we're seeing uh, this service being used. Uh, uh, some uh, pilots, some in actual everyday use. Uh, the, uh, on the very uh, left side, uh, this is a pilot that was done in the city of New York, uh, where there are about 140 languages spoken. Uh, and you need to have an ID uh, in New York City to live in the city. And so people come in who speak these different languages and what they were doing is testing out the service for communicating with people that just came in off the street. How are we gonna communicate with them? We don't have an interpreter in the office and then have them be able to just sit down and get uh, information in their native language, if nothing else in text. Um, there's also kind of the tour scenario and the travel scenario, which is shown in the middle. I'll discuss this a little bit more uh, later in the talk, but this is kind of your prototypical scenario where people use this kind of technology. And then we're seeing a lot of use in the classroom as well. Uh, on the right side uh, is a classroom. Uh, this is a class uh, trade school in Toronto. Uh, the instructor at the front is talking about wines and beers. And the students are uh, from all over the world and you can see each of them has their phones open and they're getting captions uh, in their native languages. Um, so let's talk about, I kind of show, showed some of the scenarios. Let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about some of the issues with this. It's not, again, you, if you're following along on your own devices, you're probably seeing that there are some errors there, some mistakes, uh, problems with the captions. Uh, and underlyingly, uh, it follows what Jan had said. Uh, we, uh, for our service, you get uh, an audio. So someone speaking, it transmits that audio to a service in the cloud. So this is a service that operates uh, within uh, our server farms. Uh, this processes the audio and generates text. That text is then translated by the service, by the translation service. That text is then received back by uh, the user uh, and uh, you know the translate text. And then if they want it, they can actually hear the audio too. So I can receive uh, what uh, Jan uh, called TTS or text to speech. You can actually then listen to the audio in uh, your native language as well. Now there are a number of problems here with this. It's not perfect, um, but the basic idea is this, is that we have uh, someone speaking in one language. Uh, there's a speech recognition that processes them. We have some disfluency processing as Jan described. We get the te text translation, we get the text to speech, and then we do the opposite for the other user. Uh, and so we kind of see this similar to what you might see in uh, an interpretation scenario. This is an example here of an actual interpreter between uh, President Xi Jinping of China and the CEO of Microsoft here on the right, uh, Satya Nadella. Um, and at a glance, I mean, it looks like, oh, well, we just want to emulate what uh, the interpreter is doing. It seems like for a naive uh, developer, that seems like, oh, this is a trivial thing to do. And no, it is not trivial at all. As all of you know, this is actually a very difficult thing to do. And so our some of our uh, thinking on this, we, we, as we started testing some of these kinds of features, we ran into some roadblocks. And some of them were just you know, so obvious up front. Well, once we started working on it, that it, it, it was kind of painful in a way that we didn't think of them. One of the things that uh, we realized after we started working on this is that people just don't talk the way they write. So we build our translation systems like Jan talked about over data on the web or data from parallel data from various sources, let's say from the European Parliament or what have you, that data, the way it's written is not the way we talk. So there's a mismatch already between the translation systems for speech translation versus just text translation. People are very disfluent, um, amazingly so. In fact, it's if you get just raw transcripts of someone talking, it's very difficult to understand what they're saying. Our minds are very good at filtering out these disfluencies. We don't even notice them. But if they show up in the transcripts, we can't filter them anymore and they're very difficult to read. So we have to emulate this process of disfluency processing in a way that makes it easier to read. 
And then likewise, people don't talk with punctuation. When we read, we need punctuation. When we translate using an automated service, we need punctuation. So somehow we have to put in appropriate punctuation to make this all work. So all of these problems are compounded uh, in uh, translation. So here's an example. This is, I'm gonna be showing examples from real data, actual data where people spoke. At the bottom is what the person said. At the top is what that person intended to say. And for an individual that's listening to him, you kind of filter out all of that and you really get the intent. But a machine doesn't. If you just start translating uh, the text that he said, you get all these kinds of weird translations that don't mean anything in the target language. A good example that Jan brought up is you know, we love to say, you know, in English, we say, you know, all the time. But when you translate that to German, you know, a German will look at you look like, why does this person keep saying that I know something? Weiss du, weiss du, weiss. What, what is this? This person is crazy. And so you don't want to translate these things when it's uh, not appropriate to translate them, but you do want to translate them when it is appropriate. And here's some translations for other languages as well. If we filter out the disfluencies, guess what? We get much better translations. So a lot of the art of this is figuring out how to filter out a lot of this stuff, this fluff that doesn't, isn't relevant to the discourse and get a better translation. And it's more than just removing uh, typical disfluency markers. So if we don't get the punctuation right, we get bad translations. Here's a good example. Uh, in Spanish, where the, the source is uh, you know, a question, but we translate it as, a, uh, as an imperative. And that's a problem because it can totally break the, the discourse if we don't get that. But the only difference between these is a slight difference in tone. Now, a human trans, uh, 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 interpreter would get that right away. A machine has a much harder time with that. Here's another example where there's just a very subtle difference between the two. There's a slight pause after the no. And if we have that slight pause, then it means it's two sentences. If there isn't that pause, then it's one. And it completely changes the meaning. And this is another good example. This is from an actual conversation. I love this one, where uh, in the Spanish, uh, the person had the no in there, no, you know, as a, as a question, uh, but uh, as kind of right. Uh, and the translation should be what you see at the top there, but what happened uh, to the poor uh, uh, speaker is uh, he more or less inverted uh, what he was talking about and said, your daughter is not very beautiful. It was, it was kind of a disaster in a way. So the person was like, what? And then it was like, you know, had to recover and repeat. Uh, it wasn't intended that way, of course. And the machine got it terribly wrong. But let's suppose that we get all of this fixed, that all of these kind of problems that we have with you know, punctuation and disfluency and all that, and we model the conversation. So we have a perfect system uh, that, can, that can do uh, the, the technology. There's still a lot to accomplish here. There's still a lot to make this work. So let's, uh, here's a mock-up of a conversation between two speakers, one speaking English, one speaking French, and they turn take, they go back and forth. So if it's perfect, this seems like a perfect model, right? We can just go, you know, one person speaks, you get the translation, then the other person speaks. The other person speaks, you get the translation, and then it comes back to the first person again. <clears throat> and we tested this model out with users. It seems like, oh, this should work perfectly. Wrong. It's even with a perfect system, people hated it. Even when the translations and the, uh, and, the, and the captions were perfect every time, they hated it because they didn't like to have an enforced turn-taking system. Conversations don't work that way. When we talk with each other, there's this con, uh, uh, you know, consistent back and forth between speakers in a conversation. We don't sit there and like say something and then wait and fold our arms and wait for, for things to happen. We're engaged with the other person. We're going back and forth. What people want is that. They wanna be able to interrupt. They wanna be able to talk freely. And the machine needs to honor that. So it needs to basically say, oh, there's an interruption here. I need to stop translating. Oh, I shouldn't interrupt now because this person is speaking. How does it know the pragmatics of the conversation? And that's one of the biggest problems we have with these kinds of systems right now is it doesn't understand the real world kinds of knowledge. It doesn't understand the pragmatics. It doesn't understand turn taking and these kinds of things. So um, 
Uh, and then there are other uh, pragmatic and contextual challenges, which uh, Jan had alluded to. Uh, a good example is where gender is ignored. In this translation, uh, scientificas uh, is, you know, the, the crucial bit here is that these are female scientists, not just two scientists. And getting this translation wrong uh, creates something that's pragmatically completely incorrect. Uh, another example is gender mismatches when we're talking with someone. So if we're having a conversation, and we're going to Russian, let's say, uh, if we're talking in the past tense with someone we're familiar with, the form we would use differs depending on the gender of the interlocutor. Inter interlocutor. So do we use the masculine form or do we use the pe feminine form? And frankly, if you get it wrong, it's a little insulting to the other person. And this is really hard to do. Trivial for a translator, absolutely trivial for an interpreter, but for a machine, this is really hard to model. Likewise, you know, when you get into languages where there's a lot of, uh, and this is true of many languages, uh, German and Russian included, where you have, depending on uh, the stature of the individual you're talking with, you need, need to use different uh, forms. And nothing more so than in Japanese or Korean, where you have all of these honorifics and all of these different kinds of ways of speaking. If you're talking to someone who's higher than you in stature, you might use a, a variety of honorifics. If you want to be polite to someone who's like a, a coworker, but that you don't know well, you would use the polite form. If you're talking to a child, you use the direct form. If you use the direct form in the wrong place, it's insulting. It's actually jarring. And I've had people who have been in this country, Japanese speakers have been in this country for decades who understand the technology. They actually work on this technology. And when it gets it wrong, they say it's jarring. It's something that's just, uh, you know, they, it causes them to stop because it's like that isn't appropriate. What it did there is inappropriate. It's hard to model these. It's hard to get these things right. So we have systems that work. I mean, you're seeing it. It's, it's captioning me and it's translating me as I'm talking, right? It's doing that. Now it's not perfect, but it's doing a remarkably good job. And in a lecture scenario, it's actually, this is pretty useful. And so we see this both in our system at Microsoft and at Karlsruhe, which is the university that Jan uh, was at before, uh, they have the system that they use in lectures. So it works at scale. It can uh, translate across multiple languages simultaneously, which is pretty remarkable. Is it good enough? I think so, depending on the scenario. Do users have issues with errors? Again, it depends on the scenarios. And humans, shockingly, are surprisingly adaptive. So let me talk a little bit about some use cases. Uh, the first time, and this I, I, we should have had this in our slides, we came out with Skype Translator in 2016. This was the first implementation of speech translation at scale, where people could use Skype, and it's still there, by the way, you can use Skype and tra it automatically translate for you. You can have a conversation with someone in a different locale, and then it will translate. So it has this model that I described where you do turn taking. So it enforces that turn taking, which is a little frustrating, but better than having nothing at all. We tested this with students. So in this particular uh, case, we had students in Seattle talking with students in Beijing. And uh, you can see some of the translations there on the right of them having a conversation. And we just set them down and let them go. You know, you guys go ahead and talk with each other and let's see what happens. They were on the computer for over two hours talking with each other, going back and forth. It was amazing. Actually, it was, it was at the two hour mark, parents were showing up at school because it was time for dinner and the kids didn't want to leave. The kids in Beijing had to go to class. They didn't want to leave either. We finally said, you guys, we have to stop now. And we shut the computer down over booze. You know, the kids did not want to stop. <clears throat> and in fact, they kept asking, when are we going to do this again? And what was cool about the conversations here is the kinds of conversations they were able to have. It was really endearing. Um, do you have phones? One of the kids asked. I mean, like, what a preposterous question to ask. But they didn't know. They don't know anything about China. They don't know, you know, the life in China. And so all of the kids in, on, the, on the Beijing side, of course, hold up their phones. They all had iPhones, of course. Uh, you know, what do you eat? I like pizza. The response, you know, one of the students kind of laughingly said, well, I don't like pizza so much. I like noodles. And then, um, you know, questions like, do you play a musical instrument? Do you uh, wear uniforms to school? All these kinds of things, you know, just getting them familiar with what life was like in this other country, but all translated. So these kids that didn't speak the same language were all of a sudden able to engage with each other in a way that was just remarkable.
it wasn't perfect at all. There were a lot of mistranslations. And in 2016, the technology wasn't as good as it is now. It's still improving. But the students adapted. So what happened was when I would get a translation wrong, they knew, oh, I'll just say it again. I'll rephrase it. Okay, it's still not getting it. I'm going to type it. And this, and it, almost immediately, they adopted this approach where they had this kind of hybrid way of talking with each other. When the when the uh, speech transcription wasn't working, when the translation wasn't working, they used the 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 IM. They would IM to each other, which is you know you would th think that would be totally natural, and it was. We're also seeing use in the classroom. So this is a, from an actual uh, parent-teacher conference at a school in Seattle. The principal is up here at the front of the room. Uh, this is his IT person. Uh, these parents come from all around the world. They speak nine different languages in this audience and they're getting captions of what the principal is talking about. You know, lunch is gonna be at noon this uh, on uh, Tuesday, but that 11 o'clock on Thursday, you need to pick up your kids at uh, four o'clock on Friday. You know, just kind of basic things that he would uh, normally talk about, the parents could get this. Now, what he had done in the past, so at his school, there are 40 different languages spoken at his school. It's impossible for him to basically have a parent-teacher conference like this with 40 languages using the, the approach he had used before, he had tables set up where he had five different languages, the five most spoken languages set up for the different tables. And one time what convinced him that this technology was useful, uh, and he still has interpreters there for those languages, but for the other languages, he uses the automatic system. Uh, he had a parent showed up who spoke Russian. He had the five languages there, Russian was not one of those languages. She came, in, sat, uh, came into the room, there was no Russian interpreter. She sat down at the Spanish table and that was the last time he ever saw her. That's tragic in a way. What he's been able to do now is open the door uh, to additional parents to be involved in their children's education uh, and still have uh, the human interpreters in the room for uh, those languages. And, and, and it's better quality, of course, too. Um, so in the classroom, here's some examples uh, where it's being used in the classroom. These are all from live classrooms. Um, um, and uh, I, I talked about the first case already. This is actually me giving a lecture to a, a group of Chinese students who are getting captions in their language. And we had an interaction. So you see why the, the teacher here, he actually is using his phone and he's asking questions and the questions show up in English and then I'm able to answer them in English. And here are students looking at the captions on their computers. Uh, here's an example of a uh, front office uh, a parent teacher, you know, parents just walk in and uh, they, they use the system and communicate through their phones uh, with uh, the person in the front office. And then this is an example of the technology, which I find really interesting. Here we have um, a Chinese student who knows English relatively well, but his knowledge is more passive. He understands it well. He has a difficult time writing in the language. So what he does is he basically uses um, uh, captioning. So he captions, and this is in Notepad, he captions in Chinese, gets the English translation, copies of that, and then edits the English translation. So he composes in Chinese in his, in his head, lets it do the translation, and then he fixes the translation the way he wants to have it expressed, which is a very interesting use of this technology. And then finally, the prototypical kind of scenario, which is in travel, which we're seeing a lot of use for, you know, you see this with Google Translate, you see it with Microsoft Translate, where you have kind of these scenarios where people in the world are using this technology to communicate with, with one another. A couple of vignettes. Uh, I have a friend uh, just last week uh, who's in Luxembourg uh, or was in Luxembourg, um, and she uh, speaks a little bit of French but didn't know technical vocabulary. So she was using the translator to basically get the technical words. She just didn't know how to translate those. The person who spoke French didn't understand her. She then used the app to basically get uh, the vocabulary. So that person was like, oh, that's what you mean. So it was aiding her own French, which you know is kind of rusty and, and not very good. Uh, the picture here on the right is a tour guide in Iceland who has been using this with uh, people from around the world. He's driving a bus, he speaks in English. They get the captions in English and in their native language. So that if they, if you know, he's speaking uh, Iceland, Icelandic accented English, which is difficult for them to understand. They're getting the captions in English, which makes it a lot easier. Many of them can read English just fine. If they don't understand the word, they can look at the caption in their own language and see uh, what he might've said. 
And then uh, this last one is actually a really co uh, cool case where uh, a friend of mine was on a flight where there was a group of Chinese tourists that were getting increasingly agitated because the plane had been on the tarmac for two hours. They didn't understand the announcements. They didn't know what was going on. You had about 50 people on this plane that didn't speak the language. He got out the app, spoke into it. It said something in Chinese and they're like, oh, we're gonna be here for another half hour. They all smiled and sat down. And then uh, uh, last couple of bits here, I just wanna talk about the use of this technology and accessibility. We're seeing a lot of use with people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Here's an example of a student who has a cochlear implant who uses this. He hears, but sometimes he misses words. He uses this to fill in the gaps. So this is uh, you know English only, but uh, we see it also being used in cross-lingual kinds of communication. So I have a, a friend of mine um, who is a deaf singer. Uh, she, uh, her, uh, her in-laws are uh, French speaking. She can't read their lips. Uh, she, they don't understand ASL, which is the sign language. So she has not really been able to communicate with them through the apps. It translates to French for her. She's able to have a, con a conversation with them that she's not been able to have before. Uh, and then also we can model different voices. This is a professor here uh, at a university in the United States who is deaf but his first language is English. He prefers to speak in English, but the captioning service didn't do well for him. We adapted it to his voice and then the students get captions on their own devices. These are hearing students who are getting captions of a deaf speaking person. So interesting kind of stretches and edge cases of this technology. And finally, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about what's next. And I think that's, that's important and I'll end with this. Um, I think uh, if you've been following, you'll see the limitations. There are problems with this technology. It's not perfect, but it's remarkably good in a lot of cases. Uh, and so I think where we see this world going is that given these limits, maybe there's a pairing between AI and the human interpreter. And the analog I bring up here is what's happened in the field of machine translation and the translator. 10 years ago, a lot of people were saying, oh, uh, tra machine translation is gonna replace us. And that's exactly the opposite of what's happened. All that's happened is that the industry has grown hugely by, by orders of magnitude. It's much bigger than it was uh, you know, 10 years ago. And machine translation is an aid to the translator now, not a replacement. And I think maybe something like that can happen uh, with interpretation. We still have a long way to go to make that happen, but we can see AI reducing the cognitive load of the translator, maybe providing or increasing the memory span. So you have like captions, maybe just in the native language that you can go back and look at. Oh yeah, that's the word he said. Uh, I need to translate that now. So maybe you're holding, uh, a, you know, like you're translating from English to Japanese. You have to hold that verb for a long time and then you forget the verb, but you look on the transcript and say, oh, that's the verb that was said. Um, and maybe there's some division of labor. The machine does kind of the remote manual work including uh, uh, captioning the interpreter. Maybe the reverse can happen, the interpreter speaking, and that gets captioned so that people get captions of whatever their interpreter is saying uh, in their native languages. Um, and let the human do the creative real world work. I think that's where we're going and that's kind of what's happened in the translation industry. Let the machine do the rote boring stuff, let the human do the creative stuff. And then uh, we're seeing beginnings of research in this area. And, and I've worked in this some too. There's uh, some models that we've worked on that have not been realized yet where we actually look at this, what can be done. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.